Welcome to Washington Unplugged. I'm John Dickerson. Attorney General Eric Holder's decision to try five detainees from Guantanamo Bay Prison in New York City has set off a fierce debate. Does it endanger the city? Does it give a platform to terrorists, one of whom, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, was the mastermind of the 9-11 attack? Or will the trials be a demonstration that America lives up to its ideals? Joining me to discuss these issues are Major General Paul Eaton, former commanding general of the Coalition Military Assistance Training Team in Iraq, now a senior advisor with the National Security Network, and Hamilton Peterson with Keep America Safe, who also lost his father and stepmother on United Flight 93. Hamilton, I want to get your reaction first to this decision. How did you react to it? I think it is a, an extreme disappointment. I believe we are putting the residents of New York in severe danger of attack. Both Congress and the United States Supreme Court had fashioned a carefully crafted law to prosecute these combatants, these war criminals at Guantanamo. December 8th of last year, I sat in the hearing room at Guantanamo, an $80 million high-tech courthouse, ready and raring to go, and heard KSM himself, the individual who had chopped by his own admission Wall Street Journal Richard Peel's head off, Pearl's head off, and also admitted to being the mastermind of September 11th. I cannot understand why, when we're on the cusp of guilty plea, which he acknowledged in our family's presence, that we would endanger New York, endanger our country's financial capital, and divert enormous prosecutorial resources, five separate criminal trials, John, which will have to be focused on these five individuals. General, your, your reaction to the decision first. Well, first I have to, I have to state that uh, I, I deeply, profoundly regret your loss. And uh, it's, it's tough sitting next to you uh, having, uh, having that knowledge uh, that you went through that. So I, I am sorry. Thank I also uh, need to challenge the premise. Uh, we've done a terrific job in our judicial system at, at prosecuting terrorists. We've got uh, better than uh, 195 of these guys put away. Uh, the problem with Guantanamo, is that it is a primary recruiting tool for al-Qaeda. And uh, every time we uh, pick one of these guys up, Guantanamo comes up as, uh, as a recruiting tool. It's, it is, it has because you cannot buff Guantanamo enough to make it shine. It is, it is I regret, a flawed piece of real estate when it comes to uh, all things relating to our detainees. We, we've got to close it and we've got to move our judicial system, which I'm very proud of, I'm very proud of our judicial system. We've done a great job, and uh, the best place, the best message that we can do is bring these uh, detainees to New York. Let me ask a follow-up on that, General. It does then, having this happen in the light of the day, add a sort of disinfectant to the Guantanamo history. Um, Senator Leahy has said that this is a, sort of shines a light on an American justice system and is a positive story. Does that, detru does that help beat back what's happened with Guantanamo? Guantanamo needs to shift into the history for us, and uh, by by pulling these guys up, particularly this guy Muhammad, to get him up and to do to him uh, in a courtroom what we did with Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, and a number of other folks. Uh, this is our message. It is our uh, statement to the world that the American judicial system is alive and well, and this is how we treat criminals. Hamilton, what about that question of? Uh, everybody getting a chance to see Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in the way you saw him um, in this public is there is there not some benefit to that this public a moment for these these terrorists well John first of all I would just like to thank General Eaton for his kind words and his personal and family's long-term service to the country I'm well aware of that but I do respectfully agree to disagree vehemently the prosecutions to date almost entirely the well over a hundred were, were pre-9-11 attacks. President Obama, in the presence of myself and other family members, personally agreed with us that Guantanamo Bay has been unfairly mixed up with the inappropriate depictions of other bad places, such as Abu Ghraib. I think the generals made a good point. I'm more concerned about al-Qaeda's recruiting platform being provided by these trials. Once the Colorado Supermax detention facility houses these people for more than a week, once pictures of detainees in normal prison garb are flashed across the world hundreds of thousands of times, just as Abu Ghraib was and unfairly Guantanamo Bay 
we will have the same public relations challenge. This courthouse is built, it was built specifically for these defendants in mind. These are combatants caught on the f in the field. All of those previous prosecutions, John, th they're pre-9-11, and mm -hmm. it is a tremendous security risk to our country to have this trial. Do you feel like President Obama broke his promise to you in, in making this decision or in having Secretary Holder in agreeing with what uh, Attorney General Holder did? Based on my presence at that meeting, it, it appears a reasonable inference that certain special interest groups, such as Human Rights First, in essence wrote the blueprint for the President's executive order. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how well advised he is on these issues. Clearly we know that Mr. Craig is leaving the White House Counsel's Office, but I am afraid that this will turn into the ultimate recruiting platform for Al-Qaeda. I think we are aiding and abetting our enemy. These are people who have repeatedly admitted and bragged about the murders of thousands of innocents. They will use this as a device to recruit. We will have another Fort Hood on our hands. General, what, ab what about the idea that either it's a platform or if in fact Holder gets the death penalty, which he's asked for, that then Khalid Sheikh Mohammed becomes a martyr? Uh, well, we've, we've been down this road uh, before. Massawi, uh, nobody, nobody remembers uh, that as a platform, and he was one of the guys uh, involved in the, uh, in the hijacking uh, preparation. So I, I think this is going to be a non-event as far as a recruiting uh, opportunity for al-Qaeda. Uh, and it pales in the face of the uh, recruiting opportunity that Guantanamo represents and will continue to represent. So the, uh, the best effort, I believe, is to put our judicial system front and center, that we give the judge, because this is a platform also for the U.S. government to make its case against these guys. And uh, so there is a whole lot of messaging that's going to go on from, uh, from the bench. And I believe the stronger message is that the American judicial system is alive and well, and that this is how we treat criminals who attack us. One of the problems the administration's having, General, is of course dealing with the other prisoners at Guantanamo Bay. Some are going to be in military tribunals, some they're just trying to find a home for. Do you think this public uh, effort here, this decision to try these terrorists in New York, will help with the relocation of those others in Guantanamo Bay that are not going to go into military tribunals? Uh, John, the uh, we've had Guantanamo open for, what, seven, eight years? Uh, we've had three prosecutions there so far. And uh, that's simply a bad track record. So by breaking the logjam right now, we move five of the worst to New York. New Yorkers, I suspect the New Yorkers are just going to love to see these guys uh, back on their turf. And uh, then uh, that's the start, and we will begin uh, the other four categories of uh, detainees start moving them back to uh, to where they need to go. John, if I may, mm -hmm. just to, to clarify the record on an issue here. These past eight years saved American lives. Fact, the Supreme Court of the United States crafted a decision which provided the underlying guidance for our Congress to then vote and pass a law as to how to try people in this military tribunal. We were at the cusp of guilty pleas last December we were there. What we have done now by moving this to the United States, forget the tremendous fiscal waste, forget the tremendous risk of endangerment to the people of New York. The delay that will come from the federal civilian criminal court system's appeals is going to push this back even further. The rule of law in military tribunals has been demonstrated at Nuremberg with acquittals. Even back then, we've had acquittals at Guantanamo. The honorable military prosecutors who have invested their heart and soul preparing these cases. And the final point I'd like to make, if I may, John, is KSM provided under enhanced interrogation techniques information that saved American lives. Under our procedures today, KSM would have been lawyered up. Okay, that's what we're going to have to then. Will you go if these goes forward in New York? Will you attend the trial? I don't know, John. Okay. All right. Hamilton, thanks very much, General. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much. Finally today, our Fernando Suarez sat down with an oddball collection of politicians. Former Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich, Reverend Al Sharpton, and Education Secretary Ernie Duncan were in Baltimore recently on their tour of America's public schools. How did this unlikely trio come together? Take a listen. So I'm sure that both of you are tired of hearing this over and over again. The unlikely duo come together to talk about education. But in reality, 
Reverend Sharpton, you said yourself that you know you, you and the speaker disagree 98% of the time. So why now come together? I think if there's one issue that uh, people can come together on, it should and must be education. If we can't put, the, uh, put aside partisan and political differences for our children, then what can we uh, put aside things for? And I think the real test of leadership is not how bitterly you can fight, but also what common ground you can find when the principle that you believe in is involved. And I think that when uh, uh, Secretary uh, Duncan and the President uh, met with uh, Speaker Genridge and I, and uh, we all agreed that the education problem was the civil rights issue of our day. And the President said, you know, you guys should go out on the road and say that. Uh, we would have been less than who we claimed to be to our constituents to have not done it. I, thought, I think it was a test of leadership. And I think that it's something that's good we did because it's been an eye-opening experience for me to talk to the actual students around this country about what's going on in the schools. So part of it is you've got to decide if, if we can find 70 or 80 percent agreement, could we focus on getting that done or do we have to spend our time fighting over the 20 percent? I'd go further. I'd, I'd like to have Pell Grants for children K through 12, give them really dramatic choice. But I respect the fact that President Obama has taken a very courageous position for a liberal Democrat and said he wants every parent to have knowledge about their child's achievements. He wants them to have the right to have charter schools so they can pick a school to go to. He wants real accountability. And in Arne Duncan, he's picked a Secretary of Education who's serious about trying to get the system to really fundamentally change. So to have a chance to work with Reverend Sharpton on making education Marie, the first civil right. The it's okay. So to have a chance to work with Reverend Sharpton to make education the first civil right of the 21st century and have a chance to work with Secretary Duncan to see if we can actually both at the state and federal level get the right legislation and the right approaches, I think is a, is a citizenship duty and I couldn't agree more with, with Reverend Sharpton. If we can't find ways to work together for our children, then uh, how can we possibly expect our children to learn how to function in a democracy? Secretary Duncan, how do you see all of this progressing since it sort of laid out in May? Have you seen some real progress so far? I know it's only been a few months, but... We've seen dramatic progress around the country. We've seen serious changes in legislation to create better opportunities for children. So I've been unbelievably encouraged. Um, we also have more discretionary dollars than any previous administration, and we want to continue to invest in those states, in those districts, in those nonprofits and universities. There are two things, dramatically close the achievement gap and raise the bar for all students. So we have huge challenges as a country. We all are here because we feel a huge sense of urgency, but I'm telling you, I'm more hopeful than ever before because we're seeing every single place we go what's possible when we as adults do our job and have the highest of expectations for children. On the campaign trail, one of the biggest applause lines was always talking about education, something that really concerns the American people. Do you feel that the president should have made it a higher priority for him in his first term rather than perhaps something like health care that could have got more people behind him? Well, I think he's made it a huge priority. And actually, I've been amazed the other way that despite fighting two wars in the toughest economy since the Depression and working so hard in health care, he continues to come back relentlessly week after week, month after month to education. And as a president, you have many, many issues you have to deal with. What's most inspiring to me is this is one that's not an intellectual battle for him. This comes from his heart. He, the First Lady, are who they are, the leaders of our country, because they received a great education, not because they were born wealthy, not because they had a silver spoon, but because they had great teachers and great principals. Education transformed their lives. And so he gets this in a visceral way that I think is going to be hugely important going forward. Reverend Sharpton, how do you feel about that? I know that you know, President Bush made a priority for him, passing No Child Left Behind with a lot of Democratic support. Do you think the president could have maybe made it a, a more central piece? No, I, I think the president, the fact that we have seen more money, more funds go into education, the fact that the president has uh, successfully been able to bring some kind of uh, bipartisan dialogue, I think he has made it a priority. I think what you are missing is the fights. I think sometimes the media thinks that there's no controversy, there's no priority. There is priority. It's just that I think that he's been able to work with people and reach out to people that were impressed with the fact that he not only reached out with his hand, but he reached out with his policy, which I think is why Speaker Ginridge is here. 
and I think that it has absolutely uh, uh, been a priority, and I think that it will get, uh, it will net results. I think that you guys think if nobody walks away from a black eye, we didn't have a meeting. Mr. Speaker, do you agree? Well, I think, first of all, the president showed considerable courage even during the primaries with then Senator Clinton in saying bluntly he was for a real measure of school effectiveness. He was for charter schools at a time when it could have cost him a lot of support, it might have cost him the nomination. So I think he's proven it, and he's since repeated in very clear language to the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and other speeches. He appointed a reformer to be Secretary of Education. I mean, Arne Duncan is one of the most aggressive reformers in America, and every, everywhere I go, the respect that the local education leadership, the professional educators have for Secretary Duncan is, is really encouraging. So my view is that we've been given a unique opportunity and that we have a chance to reach together, and I think to some extent it works, that when you have you know, Al Sharpton and Newt Gingrich show up to talk about an issue together, you tend to get a lot more attention than if either one of us shows up by ourselves. And that's led already around the country to a conversation about education reform that I think is good and I hope is going to lead in the Congress to more receptiveness to a bipartisan approach next year to writing legislation. One last question to Secretary Duncan. I just wanted to ask you about the comments you made at Columbia University last month where you had some sharp criticism about the, the education system, saying that there was a lot of mediocrity out there, just paraphrasing. How do you feel about that? I mean, do you still stand? Do you think those were strong words to use to call it mediocre? I don't know if it's strong or weak. It's the truth. Um, we have to get dramatically better. We have a dropout rate that approaches 30% in our country. That's 1.2 million students every single year going out into the streets. And we know they're basically condemned to poverty and social failure. So we have to dramatically increase high school graduation rates. We have to make sure many more of our high school graduates are prepared to be successful in college and the world of work. And more of the same is not going to get us where we need to go. So we're going to challenge everybody to work harder, to work in different ways, to collaborate, to stretch outside their comfort zones. But I promise you, as hard as we're challenging everyone else, we're trying to look in the mirror. And I've said repeatedly, we as the Department of Education have been part of the problem. We've been this big compliance-driven bureaucracy, and we're trying to fundamentally change the business we're in from just focused on audits and compliance to scaling up what works and investing in best practices and really taking innovation to scale. And if we can change the business we're in, if we can fundamentally look in the mirror and do some things very, very differently, we want everybody else to do the same. We as adults have to change our behavior and have to change our expectations for students. More of the same is not going to get our country and our children the opportunities they desperately need and deserve. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I know time is tight, so I appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. Thank today. you very much. Thank thanks, you. thanks for having us. Thanks, right. Thanks for watching us on Washington Unplugged. Remember to join us again tomorrow at 1230 on CBSNews.com. I'm John Dickerson.